Hello again and welcome back for the second part of Faces of Freedom. I'm Larry L. Amid the warbirds here at Fantasy of Flight, we continue the village's media group's salute to America's airborne heroes. The country's very first ace pilot, Eddie Rickenbacker, once said, Aviation is proof that given the will, we have the capacity to achieve the impossible. He proved it with his 26 victories and Congressional Medal of Honor. During the next half hour, we'll meet other Americans who tested their own will and capacity to achieve in planes like the TBD Devastator. Introduced in 1937, the Devastator was the Navy's first all-metal monoplane and was billed as the most advanced torpedo bomber in the world. The Devastator carried the Mark 13 torpedo, which severely slowed the aircraft's speed and mobility, often making it an easy target during bombing runs. A fact that became painfully obvious during the Battle of Midway, where all 35 Devastators sent up against the Japanese were shot down. Aboard one of those planes was aviator Dick Webb. Megan Burke has his story. In the summer of 1941, 17-year-old Dick Webb was like the rest of his fellow Americans. His eyes were glued to headlines of the war raging in Europe. Well, Hitler had been ravaging Europe for two or three years then, you know, and everybody, in, in, in England was getting bombed and everything, and everybody knew that there was, we were going to go into war. Eager to answer his country's call, Webb joined the Navy and found himself in the battle that helped turn the tide of the war. The Americans had broken the Japanese code, and they knew that Japan was going to attack Midway. Okay. They knew that they had sent out a big fleet. The USS Enterprise and the USS Hornet followed, and the hunt for the enemy was underway, with Webb aboard one of the many torpedo bombers on the prowl. The Japanese carriers had made runs on Midway, and they had made one attack on Midway, and they were back on, the, on their carriers being refueled and rearmed. So we caught their planes on the deck of the carriers. On the offensive and inspired by the memories of Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Midway began. My pilot, Jack Sloan, said, OK, Webb, here we go. We dropped down, made our torpedo run. Maybe we was 50 feet off the water and dropped our fish. We pulled up, you know, and, and like we were supposed to, and tried, you know, made our evasion. But we got hit. Wounded and bleeding, Webb and his pilot plunged into the Pacific. But the next day, only one life raft remained. When I come to in the morning, his life raft was gone, and we never saw, never saw him again, ever. His buddy lost, but the battle won. Webb now lives with both the painful memories and the glory. I'd be willing to serve today if they, were, if they needed me. Why not? I grew up in the time when patriotism was really, really something, and your country was in needed you, you went. No questions asked. For Faces of Freedom, I'm Megan Burke. After rehabbing in the United States, Webb was sent back to combat in the battle for the Philippines. This time, he served as a radio man in the PB-4Y2, the Navy's version of the B-24. In 1953, McDonnell Aircraft began developing an all-weather attack fighter. By 1958, the jet was airborne and christened the F-4 Phantom II. The F-4 fighter boasted more than just brute power. It was configured with a sophisticated fire control radar system that could detect airborne threats and direct radar-guided missiles against them. And one of the best at flying the F-4 was John Alexander, callsign Ghost, as evidence from his winning one of the Air Force's most coveted awards. But as Christine Eschenfelder learned, Alexander, like many American heroes, is modest about his achievements. They called him Ghost because of his gray hair, but his mastery of the Phantom made John Alexander legendary. In 1983, Alexander was on an F-4 Phantom deployment to Ramstein Air Force Base. It becomes daylight, we turn the coast at Newfoundland, and we head out across the North Atlantic. Everything is fine, I'm feeling good. But over the freezing Atlantic, an engine seized, and Ghost fought successfully to bring the crippled fighter back to land. Finally, at the uh, Air Force Test Pilot School, they ran this scenario, and they came back and said, those guys are lucky to be alive. He says, we can't make that airplane fly in that configuration with a seized engine. For his superior airmanship, Ghost was awarded the prestigious Collegian Trophy. Only one is given each year. 
But Alexander was no stranger to critical situations. In Vietnam, he was flying C-130s when his crew was shot down. We actually stayed airborne for eight minutes after we got shot up. So we had gone in to rescue an Army Special Forces team who was being overrun. That mission earned Alexander a Purple Heart, but even with all these honors, Ghost remains humble. The real hero in my whole in this family is my dad, World War II pilot, B-47s. Another one of Alexander's heroes, his brother Jim, a T-38 instructor pilot who died after a training accident. You know, my brother's the one that made the ultimate sacrifice, and uh, for that, uh, now I'm proud of him. Yeah. His other heroes, brother Steve, an Army lieutenant colonel who recently returned from a long tour in Iraq, and Alexander's twin sons, who both graduated from the Air Force Academy. His son Jim is a special ops pilot. In 2002, Jim was selected to fly the Wright brothers' replica aircraft. Ghost's other son Steve is an F-16 test pilot. And he's been selected as one of the guys to go fly the F-22, the newest, biggest, baddest fighter in the world. Thousands of hours of flight time, dozens of awards, but for the Alexander family and for Ghost, the American spirit of patriotism is among the greatest honors. It makes you feel good that, that, to know that people do care. It makes you feel like it's worthwhile. An amazing record. Alexander retired from the Air Force in 1989, but that did not keep him out of the air. He flew 727s for Federal Express until his retirement in 2004. Still to come, they overcame segregation and prejudice with the opportunity to serve their country. The story of the Tuskegee Airmen when Faces of Freedom returns. This portion of Faces of Freedom has been brought to you by these sponsors. Welcome back to Faces of Freedom. I'm Larry L. We continue now with our look at the men and women who risked everything, all in the name of freedom, America's airborne heroes. You know, when they headed overseas, most Americans knew that's where the enemy was. However, in the 1940s, because of segregation and prejudice, many African Americans might have said the enemy was stateside too, yet they still wanted to serve their country. And those who wanted to do so as pilots faced some intense opposition. But that didn't stop the Tuskegee Airmen from defying the odds. The nearly 450 airmen who went to war accounted for 409 destroyed or damaged enemy aircraft and one sunk enemy destroyer. Tuskegee pilots won 150 distinguished flying crosses, 14 bronze stars, and 744 air medals. Their heroics made them one of the most highly respected fighter groups of World War II. In the skies over Europe, they had no equal. Yet overcoming inequality back home was perhaps their biggest fight of all. A perseverance that led black men from all over the nation to Tuskegee, Alabama. The first of many difficult steps on their journey into aviation history. Got to Washington and was told, back into the back, so wait a minute, I'm on my way to become an Air Force pilot. Doesn't make any difference in the back. It was 1943 when Hal King left New York for his Army Air Corps training in the Deep South, a place where prejudice would test his resolve as a pilot as well as an American. But like his fellow pioneers, the example set by Commanding Officer Benjamin O. Davis inspired them to contribute to the legend of the Tuskegee Airmen. He said, you are now representing not just the United States Air Force, you represent the whole of the black community to show that you had the ability and to be able to press that ability into making you the best that they made. A striving to be the best that yielded a phenomenal combat record. The Tuskegee Airmen comprised the 99th Fighter Squadron, which flew bomber escort over Italy and Germany, and remarkably never lost a bomber to enemy fighters. A reputation which preceded them in battle and many times left them with little to shoot at. No kills, but I got an awful lot of bullets to hold. <laughs> An adrenaline rush earned at the controls of a P-40 Warhawk and a P-47 Thunderbolt. However, as the war continued, so did the arrival of reinforcements from Tuskegee. So pilots taller than six feet, like King, were sent back to the U.S. to train in B-25 bombers. The war ended before he could return to action, but it didn't stop him from achieving the rank of colonel. 
a testament to the caliber of men who not only helped break down racial barriers in the military, but eventually in society as well. We opened the doors not just for flying, because people began to recognize, wait a minute, you're giving us a story that these people can't meet this requirement, and here you say they couldn't fly, look at what they've done in the air. If they could do that, what would make you one of the ground? So it just opened the doors all over the place. King's old flight suit was donated to be part of an Air Force exhibit about the Tuskegee Airmen. His son also became a pilot and flew tankers in Vietnam. Now in the Battle of the Pacific, there were few greater threats to Allied bombers than the Mitsubishi Zero. The Agile Fighter was Japan's most famous and perhaps most formidable aircraft. But America's B-25 Mitchell wasn't your average target. It was heavily armored with enough machine guns to be able to shoot down attacking enemy aircraft. And no one knows that better than Jack Jordan, as Kevin Coughlin explains. You're scared. I don't care who you are. A lot of guys say they weren't. I don't believe it. I was scared. For Jack Jordan, it was a day he would never forget. His crew had seen combat before, but as a navigator, it had never hit so close to home. It was his 51st mission, and Jordan, or Flash as he was called, would have to leave his seat and become a gunner. While in the air over Burma, he came face to face with the enemy. We were one of the wing ships, and this Zero came along, and he apparently just sat there because the co-pilot said, hey, Flash, go get that guy. The Japanese Zero, one of the most aggressive aircrafts in the sky during World War II. Its maneuverability far surpassed anything the United States had in the air, and its mission was simple, attack and kill the enemy. So as Jordan hurried to the back of the B-25, he knew that his quick response would make the difference between life and death. All I could think about was just getting back there fast enough to get a shot. Jordan also remembered the new window that was put into the B-25, called a Doolittle window, which allowed gunners to shoot at targets from the side of the plane instead of only from the top and bottom. This was the first time the Doolittle window had ever been used in combat. All I could think of was my dad when I was shooting, don't forget to lead him. Well, he was going the same speed, so I didn't have to lead him very far. So I just give him about a foot and a half, I thought, in front of the cockpit and then just let it run through and he immediately just flipped away. But Jordan wasn't sure what had actually happened to the Zero until later during a critique of the mission. When we got back to home base, two of the lower gunners saw the kill. So I, that was confirmation. So then I became Ace Jordan. And it was at that moment that Ace Jordan realized he had taken down one of the enemy's most prized fighting machines. It had never happened, you know, with a navigator shooting down a, an airplane that we know of, you know. Oh yeah, for 15 seconds I was a hero. For Faces of Freedom, I'm Kevin Coughlin. Jordan was 24 years old when he shot down the Japanese Zero, and now, even 63 years later, he has never considered himself a hero. When we return, rescuing the wounded at sea was just one of the many jobs of this SA-16 pilot. More Faces of Freedom in a moment. This portion of Faces of Freedom has been brought to you by these sponsors. Welcome back to Faces of Freedom, the village's media group's look at America's airborne heroes, our military aviators. With so many aircraft filling the skies, the chances of one getting shot down over water became greater. So did the need for an amphibious plane that could land at sea and perform rescue operations. In 1947, that vision became a reality with the SA-16 Albatross. Serving the U.S. Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, and numerous Allied Air Forces, the Albatross played a vital role in both Korea and Vietnam by rescuing downed airmen. A job familiar to Bob McCullough. Here's Jessica Kiss. Okay, can you think of a word for garden party attire? Today, a crossword puzzle sends Robert McCullough in search of words. But decades ago, Air Force missions sent this retired colonel in search of survivors. Bermuda, of all places. <laughs> and I went into the air rescue service there. I flew the B-17 that had the boat that was un slung underneath the belly of the airplane that we could drop to survivors if we had survivors that we would find in the ocean. 
Ultra rewarding missions when there were survivors to rescue. One particular mission that I remember was uh, a boat had sunk in the Bermuda Triangle area. We did not find any survivors. We did find some bodies floating in the water and the sharks were attacking the bodies at that time. McCullough's seven and a half years in air rescue also included 2,500 water landings in the amphibious aircraft SA-16 Albatross. One pickup I made, I landed in waves about eight foot. Four foot swells were typically the largest the planes could handle. But in 1965, McCullough traded sometimes treacherous water landings and the B-17 flights for posh sky rides in aircraft fit for U.S. presidents. As a commander in the elite Special Air Mission Squadron, McCullough flew more than 200 dignitaries. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were on immediate alert to fly dignitaries out of Washington in case there would be a missile attack. My assigned passenger was Jackie Kennedy. His list of VIP passengers also included Vice President Hubert Humphrey, Senator Robert Kennedy, and Secretary of State Dean Rusk. In my career of uh, 42 years of flying, I was qualified as a pilot in command of 21 different airplanes. Any young person wondering what to do, a military background is a wonderful way to go. McCullough retired from the Air Force in 1970. He spent the next four years as a pilot for a private travel club out of Michigan. But ultimately, it was a desire to be with family that kept him in Michigan for the next 18 years as a safety inspector for the FAA. Reporting for Faces of Freedom, I'm Jessica Kiss. Between Robert McCullough's career in aviation and vacations with his wife, he's visited a total of 105 countries. When Faces of Freedom returns, we'll climb back aboard the B-17 bomber, this time from the vantage point of the bombardier. Stay with us. This portion of Faces of Freedom has been brought to you by these sponsors. Welcome back to Faces of Freedom, America's Airborne Heroes. I'm Larry L. The mission of all B-17 bombers was to deliver bombs accurately on selected targets. To navigate through clouds while evading and countering enemy defenses was an achievement in itself. But success depended on bombardiers like William Rich being able to hit their target, all while doing so from one of the most vulnerable spots on the aircraft, the nose of the plane. Okay, you're entering the bomb bay right now. This is it. A step through the B-17 hatch was more like a leap back in time. A 60-year flashback where William Rich, civilian, was once again Master Sergeant William Rich, U.S. Army Air Corps. It's just like being back there at that time and, and seeing the position that, like I told somebody today, when I grabbed a hold of that caliber 50 machine gun, I felt it home. However, the belly of the Flying Fortress is far more protected position than the one he had during the war. Yeah, I was right up in here though. See there? As a bombardier, his seat in the plexiglass nose offered the best vantage point, as well as the most vulnerable. I could look out there and see all that uh, flak, see the other planes going down and being shot, and tearing up, maybe some of the guys on fire and some of the guys maybe not able to get out. Yeah, I was scared. As a member of the 95th Bomb Group, danger was a persistent reality. Daylight bombing runs over Germany meant every mission could be their last. They said the average life of a gunner was 12 missions. And at that time, we were told it was only 25 required to rotate back to the state. I said, well, I'm ready to go on my 12 missions then. His crew flew 35 missions, including some of the first raids on Berlin. Despite returning safely each time, Rich recalled moments where he doubted he would survive, a fate he nearly suffered after his bomber lost control while landing on an icy runway. I'm in the nose with the navigator. I looked at him, I said, Lieutenant, we better get out of here. If we couldn't stop, you better believe that there'll be some other planes that'll have the same problem. Even though they survived the landing, the crew was nearly killed as they fled when another bomber just missed them and slammed into their B-17. Every man got out of it, nobody hurt, and that was really a miracle. I'll never forget that one. And they'll likely never forget their valiant efforts in the fight for freedom. I'm glad that I had the privilege to do what I could to preserve our freedom and our way of life and our families. I've heard a lot of people say that we were maybe 
heroes, but I don't think so. I did what I was trained to do. For Faces of Freedom, I'm Mark Giblin. Rich received many medals during his military career, including the Soldier's Medal for saving a child's life after his aircraft crashed into two homes. Coming up, the hazards of resupplying troops while flying the Huey in Vietnam, when the Village's Media Group's presentation of Faces of Freedom continues. This portion of Faces of Freedom has been brought to you by these sponsors. Welcome back to Faces of Freedom, the Village's media group's look at the men and women who we call America's airborne heroes. Helicopters play a vital role in the military. Perhaps one of the more recognizable is this Bell 47G, made famous by the TV show MASH. But it's another Bell chopper that is the most widely used in the armed forces, the Bell UH-1, better known as the Huey. Its functions are many, including medevac, command and control, personnel transport, and as an air assault gunship. The Huey began arriving in Vietnam in 1963, and by the end of the conflict, more than 5,000 had been used. One pilot of Vietnam's most versatile aircraft was Glenn Mantooth. Glenn Mantooth never saw himself in a college classroom. A cockpit was the only place he ever wanted to sit. At that time, the Air Force had restrictions on how many they could enlist, and they already had their quota. So he said, well, I can uh, put you in the Army, and uh, then uh, later on you can fly. So after an infantry tour of duty in Korea, he headed to helicopter flight school. Then it was off to war again, this time with the 1st Aviation Unit sent to Vietnam, where his Huey was assigned to the South Vietnamese Army. And there were times when my crew chief and gunner had to actually throw these Vietnamese off the aircraft because they didn't want to get out. And the longer the chopper stayed stationary, the better target it became. Even on the move, flying low and slow made the Huey and its crew vulnerable. Very at first, because uh, we did not have the armored seats. Uh, we had uh, uh, flak vests, and uh, the Huey has a chin bubble down at the bottom. And we always laid one flak vest in there, and then we had the other one that we wore. However, there was no way to defend against a well-placed shot. On a resupply mission to a Vietnamese village, Mantooth's chopper took ground fire into its engine. And when you have a turbine engine with that turbine speed of about 58,000 RPM, mm -hmm. uh, one bullet in there, just everything just goes out the rear end of the engine. And uh, we went down the mountainside. Uh, I found out later we left the skid in the treetop. Luck was with Mantooth's crew that day. The impact ruptured all five of the Huey's fuel cells, but none caught fire. And 15 minutes after crashing, troops arrived. I saw these uh, Vietnamese in black pajamas coming through the jungle uh, into the clearing. And I still wasn't, I didn't know who they were. So I put around in the chamber of the rifle and they heard it. And they started yelling, no, no, okay, okay. And that was kind of a sign that they were friendly. Mantooth had a broken back and ankle and returned stateside. Two years later, he went back for a second tour as a test pilot. His career also included flying support for President Kennedy's trip to Ireland and dropping paratroopers during filming of the movie The Longest Day, never once regretting his path to the sky. I'll do it again in a minute. After flying helicopters, Mantooth went on to sell them to foreign countries. In his 27 years of service, he visited all 50 states and 56 nations. Now, of the many stories to tell, these were but a few permitted by time. So here's a quick look at others who contributed their best to the ideals of freedom. Andrew Fortunato spent three years in the Army during World War II as an aircraft mechanic on a P-47 Thunderbolt. He was assigned to a mobile repair unit in France. Lieutenant Doug Tharp's seven years in the Navy were spent in the South Pacific, where he flew the HSS 1N Seabat and the SA-16 Albatross. Tharp's missions include anti-submarine warfare and search and rescue aboard twin-engine amphibious aircraft. Major Richard Strine is a Vietnam and Cold War vet who spent 20 years in the Air Force as a navigator aboard the C-130 Hercules and the C-133 Cargo Master, along with the C-141 Starlifter, transporting items like Atlas missiles and the Gemini capsules. Lou Branch's 24 years of service in the Army Air Corps saw him achieve the rank of Major while piloting the B-25, BT-13, B-47, and the B-52 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. First Lieutenant Robert Benson spent 17 years in the Air Force as a pilot of the F-94 Starfire during Korea and the Cold War. 
flying as part of the Devil Cats to protect the United States from being attacked and identifying unknown aircraft to air controllers. Flying the Huey was the role of Major Richard Walter during Vietnam. While there, his copter took small arms fire and he had to make a crash landing. Walter earned the Bronze Star. We hope you enjoyed our look at these men and women who answered their nation's call, their stories and their lives, part of the vast tapestry of aviation history. Heroes some, patriots all. Their efforts are selfless and service worthy of a place of honor among America's faces of freedom. For the Villages Media Group, I'm Larry L. Thanks for joining us. This Faces of Freedom special presentation was brought to you in partnership by the Villages Media Group, Properties of the Villages, and Comcast.